The Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy will celebrate its silver anniversary in January 2020. Elevate your genealogical education to new heights. At SLIG, you will learn from the field's top professionals, obtain in-depth instruction, network with respected experts, consult with successful researchers, and research at the Family History Library. Registration opens July 13, 2019 at 9 a.m. Mountain Time. We've asked the course coordinator to tell us a little bit about the course to help you decide if it's the right fit for you. Certified genealogist, Reverend David McDonald is the course coordinator for Early U.S. Church Records. Keep watching to learn more about his background and the course. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm the course coordinator for the Religions Track at SLIG in January 2020. I've been the president of BCG. I, I work for Ancestry uh, Pro Genealogists. I'm the vice president of the Association of Professional Genealogists. I lecture for the National Genealogical Society, for the Federation of Genealogical Societies, um, state societies, local societies. Uh, my research specialties are particular content contexts of interest. Uh, geographically, I, I do a lot of work here in the Midwest, but I also, I've done basically the entire eastern seaboard, uh, perhaps with the exception of Florida. Uh, overseas, I do a lot of work in Britain and Ireland, uh, Scotland. I uh, have had very good luck and good fortune in uh, Germany and, and uh, uh, Germanic Europe. How long have you been working on genealogy and how did you become interested in it? I started doing genealogy as a school project in the, in the eighth grade in the fall of 1977. And I have been doing professional genealogical research. Uh, I took my first paid client when I was a sophomore in high school in the winter of 1980. So I have been uh, avocationally at genealogy for 40, by the time we get started, almost 43 years uh, and uh, have been doing it uh, on a, what I would call a regularly profession level for almost 30 years. Have you had any prior SLIG experience? I was a student in Warren uh, Bittner's uh, Germanic research class in uh, 2015. I have taught this religions track at, at SLIG uh, in 2016. And uh, I am an occasional lecturer in uh, Judy Russell's uh, law class talking about churches and the law. Uh, I have been, uh, depending on if I'm in Salt Lake City and I'm not doing a course, I will occasionally uh, lecture in other people's classes. But for 2020, I will be in my track on religions and their records, and I'll be in the uh, in the law class that Judy uh, Russell is coordinating. What course will you be coordinating? In 2020, I'm coordinating the course on religions and their records. Uh, again, it's a it's a course that will cover. Uh, a number of religious traditions, the Catholic Church, the Anglican or Episcopal Church, Presbyterians, Methodists, Disciples of Christ, uh, a lot of the what we now would call mainline uh, church traditions. We'll talk about their history, we'll talk about the records they create, and we'll talk about effective use of those records in, in genealogical research. What are the main topics covered in the course? Primarily our work in the course is to give people a better understanding of, of in part why and what uh, the religious records can do in substitution for vital records. As you know, uh, a lot of the vital records just don't exist until the turn of the last century. And prior to that, church records are vital to be able to get through on families to identify discrete family groups and particular individuals in those families. We'll talk about church history to an extent so you can understand from cultural clues um, where your families might have fit on the religious spectrum, if that makes any sense. Um, some people, some traditions, for example, in this day and age, uh, during, during Lent, uh, Catholics don't eat meat on Fridays. Uh, and so that may be a memory that sticks out in somebody's head about, well, their family didn't eat meat on Fridays. Well, that's a pretty good clue that they might've been Catholic. Um, things like, did they or did they not play cards? Um, do they, do they not dance? Do they, do they not consume beverage alcohol? Um, those kinds of clues uh, can be useful if you don't know exactly what their family uh, religious custom or, or denominational background is. And so the intent is to, yes, discover and discuss what's present in the records, but also equip the class with some skills to intuit where their families fit. Who would benefit the most from this course? The course is best suited for intermediate researchers, those who have exposure and experience and have already mastered 
the beginning skills of compiling and knowing to look in certain places uh, for the records that relate to their family. Religious records tend to be a sort of a second line. It doesn't mean they're secondary, but they tend to be a second line. You, when we begin our research, we go for the low hanging fruit, we go for census records, we go for vital records when we can get them. Church records can be in that first line, but usually they are sought in substitution for records that either no longer or never did exist. Uh, if it's prior to the beginning of civil registration or vital records creation, the churches provide uh, often very good uh, alternate materials that can confirm a birth date, a marriage, or, or a death event. Uh, but you have to have some adeptness at puzzling out what you know you've been missing or you've wondered about. Um, I'm happy, I'm, I'm ecstatic when beginners come into my class because I, 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 I enjoy teaching folks who are, who are new and enthusiastic in that, in that beginning sort of way. And advanced colleagues who might want to be taking it and learn more specifically about um, ways in which religious records can, can help them bridge a gap for their clients or bridge a gap in their own research that's certainly an appropriate uh, venue for them to come, but but it's I, I genuinely target it towards uh, the intermediate range. That's that's my sweet spot. And uh, beginning genealogists are welcome in there and will be glad to have them. I think they'll get plenty out of it. Uh, advanced folks, um, uh, I think will find intermittent pieces of it very, very interesting if it's a religious tradition of, about which they know nothing. Uh, but intermediate folks are, are really the, the group to whom I, I would point this. What basic knowledge should students have before taking the course? Probably the best thing an, an individual can do when they come into the class, if, if they're, again, if they're doing their, this for their own research purposes or for the professional purposes of advancing their skills, they should probably have some awareness of the family group and context that their target family lived in. For example, if someone was living in upstate New York in the 1840s, where were they living? How long had they been there? Had they were they migrants from from New York who'd come up the Hudson River? Were they New Englanders who had come over uh, and gone west? If they came out of New England, for example, you can make a, a a posit that they probably ran through the congregational church records in New England. Uh, if they were from New York, all bets are off. New York City, uh, because even in the 17th century, New York was a polyglot place. You had you had Lutherans, you had uh, you had uh, uh, Catholics even. You had uh, various Anglicans, you had Quakers, you had all kinds of different religious backgrounds, uh, Dutch reform, whose records may come to bear if you've got very early colonial New York City. Uh, and so uh, come in with an awareness of, of the families that you're, you're hoping for, come in with an open mind that does not insist on uh, knowing which filing cabinet drawer in what archival office you will find your ever so great grandmother's uh, confirmation certificate. Um, because that's not what this course does. Uh, so you need to know who you want to be looking for. Come with an example of a family that you're thinking religious records might help you bridge a gap or, or fix a fix a hole. Uh, and we'll see if we can't figure some of that out. We will spend some time in the library uh, using uh, doing some exercises and finding some some church records. There's a you know among the skills we'll talk about are the use of of, uh, of uh, church Latin, for example. Uh, if you've got Catholic forebears or English forebears in the early 18th century, the registers may in fact be written in Latin. And there are some tripping points that people may have some trouble with. Uh, and so those kinds of things um, will come to bear. What should students expect to learn by the end of the course? I would hope that by the end of the week you would recognize as a learner that, um, that religion mattered in a different way to our forebears than it culturally matters to us now. Um, the, the, the diversity of perspectives that were in play 150, 200 years ago, um, religion was often the only show in town, uh, literally. Uh, the, Sunday, uh, the Sunday worship experience was the only, for lack of a better term, entertainment uh, in many places. Uh, the worship experience was was uh, far longer than what we have lived through in late 20th and early 21st century America. Um, you know, a preaching, a sermon that didn't last an hour was no sermon at all. Um, you know, the church had um, real power in people's lives uh, to govern behavior, to warrant punishments, uh, to enforce discipline uh, uh, socially or, or ecclesiastically. Um, 
the records and the materials and the churches that, that our forebears uh, created and lived in um, speak of a different time. Uh, and in the modern stage, here in the end of the 20, second decade of the 21st century, we're finding that um, those records are going to disappear uh, in many cases because people's adherence to religious customer is, to, is in the decline, has been since the Second World War, despite the blip of the, of the baby boom. We'll talk about that uh, in the opening lecture. Uh, but it also is, is a matter of um, the, the perspective's gotten broader. Um, you know, in this era, it's not unusual for a Catholic to convert to Buddhism. It may not make sense to an observer, but it happens. Um, you know, a hundred years ago, a Catholic girl marrying a Lutheran boy was the cause of family fracture. Uh, and in our day and age, we don't pay as much attention to that. Uh, it doesn't happen as often. But uh, in my own family, there's, there's a tremendous record of family rifts over you married that one and they didn't have the same religion as we did. Uh, in this day and age, people are just glad when their kids get married at all, uh, let alone religiously. Uh, so it's a very different perspective. And I hope that at the end, that students will have a, an, an appreciation of the customs, maybe even an appreciation of how the names in their families came about. Or, or you know, if you have a Lorenzo Dow in your family's uh, background with a name, uh, you might recognize that as a, as a Methodist name in the early 19th century. My wife's grandfather's given name uh, was Dwight, uh, named for uh, Dwight Lyman Moody, who was the great uh, ev ev evangelist of the of the late 19th century. It was kind of like um, Billy Graham in the most recent generations. And so those kinds of little bits and pieces that you can pick up that will say something. You're not going to find a Catholic kid named Dwight. Uh, you know, it's just not going to happen. Uh, on the, by the same token, when you see those kinds of names that are reflective of of, uh, of religiously prominent figures, um, it gives you it gives you proof for context, and they give you proof for records. Uh, and so, I think my hope is that folks will, in the end, uh, know have more comfortable knowledge of religious custom and practice, and what religious groups were prominent in the communities in which their forebears lived and maybe even have some clues for finding records that will give them some answers. What is an interesting teaser about your course? Over the course of the 20th century, people who adhered to church practices often had to endure the church potluck dinner. We will have a fairly lengthy discussion on the value, merits, and use of jello as a religious accoutrement and accompaniment. If you would like to know more about how your ancestors' jello consumption may be reflective of their family background and their family religious customs, you want to come to my course. We hope you enjoyed learning about Reverend David McDonald's SLIG course on early U.S. church records. Registration for SLIG courses opens July 13, 2019. Check out the website slig.ugagenealogy.org for more information.